Dude, please let me do another video by myself. Come on, people really liked it, and the Leafs have a great record when I do it. <laughs> what, a perfect 1-0? Oh? oh yeah, and your record's great. How many playoff videos do you do, bot? Look at it, finally! Go, Canadian fire! Patrick! Yeah. Deal with it. Deal with smash! Oh, and Rubowski. GTFO. I got it from a bar. <laughs> Bro, do you even lift? I'll lift you Leafs win! 4-3 over the New York Rangers. Which is a very important victory in a certain picture. I'm just not allowed to say which one. It rhymes with, you know, I don't even think I'm safe to say what it rhymes with. Oh wait, I've waited almost a decade, I'll wait. A lot happened in this game, so we'll go rapid fire. I've been saying in my videos, and Cam has been saying in the post-game blogs, that the Leafs, on many nights where they've won, have won kind of against all odds. It's almost like this year is a makeup for all the bounces they haven't got for the last, like, eight. For example, Dan Girardi has a chance to score, hits the goal post, puck goes the other way. John Michael Isle, spin pass to JVR who gets no fewer than 18 whacks at it, it goes in, the Leafs are up 1-0. A young and talented viewer of the Philadelphia Flyers, Jordan Coons, I'm going to put his Twitter handle right here, blogged for me a few months ago when JVR was traded for Luke Shen, and basically what he said was, JVR would be so damn good if he just went to the net. Well, watch this goal and there you go. And then the second goal is hilarious. I'm not sure who it was that tweeted it. I want to say Kemi from the Pension Plan Puppets. Correct me if I'm wrong. But he basically goes, Nazem Kadri can make anybody look good. He sets up Ryan O'Byrne, a.k.a. Pavel O'Byrne, apparently, for his first goal in his first game as a Leaf. Just the fifth goal of his career. The sixth, if you count that one he scored on his own net when he was with Montreal. Kessel's first goal of the night would make it 3-1. But let me back up and go forward. Talk about the Rangers' 2-1 goal and the Rangers 3-2 goal, because they were uh, concerning. Rick Nash just making the Cody Franz and Mark Frazier pairing look kind of silly. And that concerns me from a pl um, time after the regular season perspective. Does that make sense? It concerns me for uh, a time that comes after the regular season, but but you still keep playing hockey, and, and it's not the World Championships. If such a time did exist, I wouldn't know what to call it, but but uh, the Leafs, it, it concerns me for that. Rick Nash, and basically that whole line was rolling for big chunks of that game. And if you get into a situation where you, uh, let, let's say you play a, a team uh, uh, as many as uh, seven times in a row, yeah, you, you know what I mean? Who do you put out there to stop that line? I don't think the Leafs really have that effective of a shutdown pairing in their whole roster, no matter who you put together. If enough can shut guys down if you just tell them to stick to them like Lou, but a lot of guys can outskate him, and I'd rather him be producing offense. But I think in that sort of situation, that's when you start to see Mikhail Grabowski become much more of a factor because he can skate amazingly, and he's been much more of a shutdown guy this year. And no matter how good of a Shane Corson-esque job he does, he'll still get criticized for not scoring, so who cares. Anyway, the Rangers have tied it. The Leafs have coughed up a 3-1 lead. Crushing, it's 3-3. But the Leafs showing a little chutzpah that they haven't in the last few years, and the Rangers showing a little... M meh? Spa? That's not a word. But less than a minute later, the Leafs are able to recover. Bozak to Kessel. Kessel gets a couple attempts. Again, multiple attempts on Henrik Lundqvist. Leafs score what would turn out to be the game-winning goal. Klo had a great chance to score in the third. Couldn't beat the paddle of Reimer. Zuccarello had a chance to tie it up at 4-4. So did Rick Nash, but nothing doing. The Leafs take a big two points, 4-3 victory. Don't count those Rangers out, though, man. Assuming he's 100% healthy, Henrik Lundqvist gives you a chance to win any night. If splitting Brad Richards and Rick Nash up helps create some offense for them, which they really need, then the Rangers become a much more complete team. And I thought this all season long, I think I even tweeted it a couple times, while watching Matt Zuccarello in the KHL, he belongs in the NHL. He's good. And he had a few good chances in this one. Now, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, Phil Kessel. Two goals in this one. Way to go, Philly cheese. Lathering on that Philly cheese. A.K.A. Fromage Philly. S'il vous plaît, pantalon mercredi. I didn't do well in French. I was looking up his stats, trying to figure something out, and I came across something that didn't make sense to me. Phil Kessel has 11 multi-point games. He only has 12 single point games. He has 16 pointless games. So he has about as many multi-point games as he has single point games, but he has more games where he doesn't score a point? This to me was really weird. So what do we take from that? Do we take from that that Phil Kessel is a streaky scorer? Well, I did some looking around for more numbers and take the recently hot Alex Ovechkin, for example. Kessel has 11 multi-point games, 12 single point games, and 16 pointless games. Ovechkin has 11 multi-point games also, 14 single point games and 14 pointless games. Pretty similar numbers, but I mean, both players are accused of being streaky scorers, right? However, while I'm tweeting all this, Chris Conrad, aka The Conrad on Twitter, tweets me, 
Datsu, 13 multi-point games, 9 single-point games, 16 pointless games. Voracek, 12 multi-point games, 12 single-point games, 15 pointless games. Ribeiro, 12 multi-point games, 12 single-point games, 15 uh, pointless games. Looks like a typical point per game player. Breaking! We overanalyzed Phil Kessel. And I always criticize people for doing that and then, ah, I was doing it myself. I'm stupid. And then I'm coming up with other useless stats like, oh, the Leafs are 5, 10, and 1 when Phil Kessel doesn't get a point. Breaking! When the player who's supposed to be your top scorer isn't scoring, you do poorly. And on the opposite end of that, the Leafs are 17, 3, and 3 when Phil Kessel gets at least one point. Breaking! When your best players do well, usually your team does too. Those stats, while kind of interesting at first glance, are actually pretty typical. What isn't normal is the Leafs get outshot almost every game and they find a way to win. Lundqvist stopped 24 of 28, while Reimer stopped 31 of 34. The Leafs have a record of 8-4-2 when Reimer faces 30 or more shots. And if you include the game where Reimer got hurt against Philly, Scrivens had to come in in relief and the Leafs won. Scrivens is 5-3 and three when facing 30 or more shots. And sorry for all the numbers in this episode, but this to me is the biggest one. The Leafs have a combined record of 13-7-2 when facing 30 or more shots. I think what I'm trying to say is, what the hell was all that Kippersov crap for? So that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching and putting up with the stats. Uh, I don't know how much they help you, but now you can impress your friends. Post-game blog is in the underbar if you want to read more. I have a pretty busy day ahead, but I'm going to try to write a blog on how to make highlight packs. I've already done something like that, but this is another one. And now we prepare for the second half of the Home and Home.